Hello Crime Time Podcast, it's Joshua Mells and welcome to the third episode of this podcast featuring myself, Kirsty Sky. Say hi Kirsty. Hello. Molly Westbrook. Hello everyone. And Dark Herosities. Hi everyone. Like I say on every episode so far, this podcast is a laid-back true crime podcast, but despite its nature, it has not been made to cause disrespect or anything like that. It's just been made to spread awareness about a multitude of cases by compiling information from various different public sources on the internet. And with all that being said, let's delve straight into this podcast. Cue the theme music. Now today's oddity in the news is another news story that comes from the grand old United States of America. CNN reported on this and honestly I'm a bit baffled. Now this news story is less funny than in the past two episodes but it's more just like what the heck? Okay. Let's jump straight into it. The headline reads, Wisconsin police say they found a fugitive hiding in a solar powered bunker in the woods. Intriguing I know. (laughs) A Wisconsin man wanted on charges of incest, child sexual assault, and possession of child pornography has been hiding out for more than three years in a solar-powered makeshift bunker, according to the police. You see, Jeremiah Button has been out on a $25,000 bond for about 18 months and was two weeks away from trial when he vanished in early 2016. The man who discovered the bunker said that he was hunting on state-owned land in Marathon County back in November and found the bunker by following brush marks. He saw a door, but got out of the area quickly, understandably. If you just come across a random wooden door in the middle of the woods, you're going to be like, not today, no (laughs) thank you. But at the beginning of August, uh, this man returned back to the area because curiosity, you know, He was just curious about what it was, and it was somehow now less spooky, and he wanted to find out why somebody was maybe living there, or, you know, what was was behind the wooden door. Subsequently, the police were then dispatched, and the man who discovered the bunker brought them to what he described as a cave dug into the side of an embankment. The police then, and I love this, politely knocked on the wooden door. Oh my god. (laughs) Before the man inside answered... While they were there, they noted about eight solar panels on the roof with wires going into the bunker, along with a makeshift stovepipe, which had been built from tin cans protruding from the ground. Now, the man inside the bunker was covered in head to toe in camouflage, and after he identified himself, the officers realised he had a felony warrant out for his arrest. Now, as it turns out, this man, like I said, had been on the run for three or four years, and up until this point, nobody had come across the bunker. The man was then arrested and taken to Portage County Jail, where he's being held under a $100,000 bail. It became apparent that Jeremiah had dug the entire cave himself, expanding it when it became too cluttered. He even had his own television, fans and lighting, along with a generator hooked up to a bicycle that he would use if he needed any more power. It even created a well system for plumbing. Oh my god. It's actually insane the lengths that this man went to to run from the police. He had multiple exits to his bunker to avoid detection if there were hikers in the area. Now, a pre-trial conference is apparently scheduled for September 16th, which I believe is the day after this podcast goes live, uh, where we will find out more information. I personally just can't believe how much effort this man went to, um, and when it came down to it, and when the police showed up, he just identified himself and didn't try and run out of the many yeah. other exits he you can't, you can't deny that he was, <laughs> he, he was very resourceful. <laughs> very, very resourceful yeah. and very dedicated. Yeah. <laughs> That is crazy. That was for what, three years, did you say? Three years, yeah, wow. he lived off the land. I wonder where he got this TV from. I know. Mm. <laughs> he just goes to his local Target and just was like, <laughs> hi, <laughs> I need a TV and a bike. <laughs> but then I wonder, like, how he would have gotten, like, his money. <clears throat> yeah. I don't know. Yeah. trace that? I don't really know. I mean, obviously, you see so many, like, uh, fugitives who end up, you know, stealing to get their, you know. Well, yeah, I was waiting to say you probably yeah. stole everything. Like that. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. 
I don't know where I would get that. I know some oh. people obviously take like large amounts of cash out if they're, you know, yeah, going to be a fugitive. But I don't know if you mm-hmm. would ever consider taking out enough that would last you for three years. I, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Well, I imagine after buying the initial like things that you actually need, and then the solar panels. I feel like it's pretty easy to live off the land from then onwards. Yeah, I suppose water so. Water and food he got himself. Um, and plus, since he was living in the woods, he would have been able to like get plenty of, you know, he could, he could have foraged yeah. and like yeah. got meat and things like that. Yeah, 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 exactly. But whatever the case, amen. He's in jail because mm. what he was yeah. being, you know, found guilty of is disgusting it and is, vile. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm glad that he is uh, off the. I would say off the streets, but he's off the woods. Yeah. <laughs> <I guess. laughs> uh, and that brings us to the end of this segment. We'll be right back in the next segment where Dark Curiosities will be discussing an absolutely massive case. we're discussing today is a rather famous one it's the escape from Alcatraz now this case has fascinated me since I was really really young Um, so a basic summary is the infamous escape of three prisoners from Alcatraz federal prison caused a sensation in San Francisco in the summer of 1962 Uh, The escape was popularized by various documentaries and was memorable let me see memorably immortalised on the big screen. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of the 1979 film Escape from Alcatraz, which stars Clint Eastwood. It's one of my favourite films, mm-hmm. and it's about I the entire escape. Um, Why, what the heck? I haven't, I've heard of it, but I haven't seen it. Um, I need to watch it. I will. The, the, the plot of the entire escape was um, intricately detailed by a very intelligent man who I will explain um, about him and his life later on. And he was aided by three others in their bid for freedom. There are endless theories regarding the fate of those who who had escaped, and it is probably the most well known mystery in America, and until this day, remains a popular topic topic of discussion as the question still sits unanswered: Did the prisoners successfully escape from Alcatraz? Alcatraz prison was initially called La Isla de los Alcatraces and is located one and a quarter miles from San Francisco Bay. The prison was were commonly known as the Rock and was said to be an impenetrable fort. In other words, nobody could escape. It became a prison in 1934 and was used to hold prisoners who caused issues at other prisons. Many prisoners who passed through the weather-beaten doors were the likes of Al Capone, who was also known famously as Scarface, who was an American gangster who gained notoriety in the Prohibition era as co-founder and boss of the Chicago Outfit. Uh, The original Machine Gun Kelly, uh, not the rapper, the original guy, Uh, Another gangster from (laughs) Memphis, Tennessee, who kidnapped a businessman and successfully collected a $200,000 ransom. Other other famous prisoners included former public enemy number one, Alvin Creepy Carpus, and uh, Robert Stroud, known as the Birdman of Alcatraz. Um, If you've seen the film The Shawshank Redemption, apparently the character of Brooks Hatlin, who had a raven he was looking after, um, was apparently based on Robert Stroud. Um, So the four men involved in this escape concocted a plot to escape from their incarceration where Frank Morris, John Anglin and his brother Clarence Anglin and Alan West. They were the four that were assigned adjacent cells and they got to know each other pretty well over the course of their time in Alcatraz. So starting off with the first of them is Frank Lee Morris who was born on the 1st of September 1926 in Washington DC although in the 1940 US census it does say he was born in Maryland but it's widely believed it was Washington DC. Um, He never knew who his father was but his mother was a woman called Clara He was allegedly orphaned at age 11 and his upbringing was really tough, um, having never known his father. And his mother would only visit him occasionally up until he was around 10, 11 years old, when she just disappeared of her own accord, leaving Frank abandoned um, at a foster home. 
Um, so he spent a lot of his youth switching between foster homes um, in his youth. Um, he was first convicted of a crime when he was 13 and his crimes included theft, robbery, breaking and entering, possession of narcotics and escape attempts from other prisons. On his Alcatraz record, um, funnily enough, his occupation was stated as escape artist. He was that good. Um, <laughs> he had successfully escaped from Louisiana State Penitentiary, but was recaptured a year later during another robbery. But despite being caught for this act, he was actually highly intelligent. Um, and Frank Morris had an IQ of 133, which lies within the top 2% of the world's population. So Frank Morris was sent to Alcatraz in 1960 as prisoner AZ-1441. Now two of the others were the Anglin brothers who were born a year apart. We've got John William Anglin who was born on the 2nd of May 1930 and Clarence Anglin who was born on the 11th of May 1931. And they were born to George Anglin and Rachel Van Miller Anglin. Uh, the couple's children were born in Donaldsonville, Georgia, and they shared a whopping number of 13 children. Um, wow. The family were farm workers and labourers who relocated to Ruskin, Florida in the early 1940s. They received better income uh, in Florida, working on truck farms and picking from tomato fields and cherry trees further north. Clarence and John were described by relatives as being inseparable and were also highly skilled swimmers. They were able to swim in the icy depths of Lake Michigan in the heart of winter. And this fact is really important to remember for later on when discussing this case. Um, the brothers carried out many robberies in the 1950s. However, they waited until closing time or whenever nobody was around to carry out uh, the robbing of businesses. They actually reportedly used toy guns as well because they didn't want anybody getting hurt during their crimes. So the brothers were taken into custody in 1956 and both were given lengthy sentences at several different establishments. They both made escape attempts but were unsuccessful and that was when they were spending their time at Atlanta State Penitentiary. John arrived at Alcatraz in October 1960 and Clarence in January 1961. John's prisoner number was AZ-1476 and Clarence's was AZ-1485. So completing the four original escapees is Alan Clayton West, who was born in New York City on the 25th of March 1929. He was a convicted car thief who allegedly met Frank Morris and the Anglin brothers while they were all in Atlanta State Penitentiary. Um, he was described as being the pure opposite of Frank Morris and was said to have the mindset of a young teenager. Um, and after a botched prison break, uh, West was sent to Alcatraz in 1957 and was prisoner AZ-1335. Whilst imprisoned on the rock, Frank Morris became acquainted with a fellow inmate called Clarence Carnes, who had been involved in the notorious Battle of Alcatraz in 1946, where Carnes, Bernard Coy, Marvin Hubbard, Joseph Kretzer, Sam Shockley and Mirren Thompson attempted to escape from the prison by force. Uh, and as a result, the ringleaders Coy, Hubbard and Kretzer were killed during the conflict with officers, state police, US Marines and members of the Coast Guard. Two officers, William Miller and Harold Stites, were also killed. Clarence Carnes, um, who was serving 99 years in prison for his part in the Battle of Alcatraz, informed Frank Morris of an access tunnel which lay beneath their cells and Frank was inspired to develop an escape plan. Morris was at the helm of the operation and after examining the surroundings with Alan West, they discovered that there were ventilation shafts which allowed access to the roof of the prison. West also noted that the concrete of the building was crumbling away due to the harsh sea spray. So the quartet devised an intricately detailed plan in their bid for freedom. They worked tirelessly for many months using discarded saw blades, spoons and an improvised drill, which was actually made from a broken vacuum cleaner, to pick away at their cell walls every single night for months on end. So they concealed their progress with cardboard and paint made to look exactly like the original ventilation grills. So the 
um, wardens and guards wouldn't get suspicious. Um, that is pretty smart, though, eh? That is so clever. It is, yeah. Uh, and Frank also played his accordion to drown out the noise of his fellow prisoners chipping away at the walls. Um, now, this is one of the most um, famous parts of the case, um, and it's just mind-blowing how, how they managed to do this, but they each created dummy heads resembling themselves, sculpting them with a mixture of toothpaste, soap, concrete dust and toilet paper, what? using paint from the maintenance shop and hair which had been discarded on the floor of the barber shop. So... Wow. The plan was to place um, some of their clothes and towels beneath their bed sheets and put the dummy heads on the pillows to give the illusion that the men were sleeping soundly in their cells when they planned on escaping. Once Morris West and the Anglins dug through their cell walls, they discovered an unguarded corridor located behind the cell tier, and through this they could access the roof space of their cell block, which they actually ended up using as a workshop. Um, and throughout the months, they gathered resources, both stolen and donated by fellow inmates. They created a life jacket, the design of which was inspired by an article that they had seen in an issue of the magazine Popular Mechanics. With over 50 raincoats, they produced a 6 foot by 14 foot rubber raft. The jackets had been stitched together and sealed with heat from nearby steam pipes. So even reading all of this, it's just really, in in uh, I can never say, innovative um, yeah, it really yeah. is yeah. using all that they had. It just goes to show to how it just goes to show how smart Frank Morris really was. Yeah, yeah, you know. Um, and they made paddles with scrap pieces of wood and stolen screws, and they used a stolen concertina to improvise as bellows in order to successfully inflate the raft when the time came. Um, this idea allegedly came about after reading a copy of Sports Illustrated, which explained how to enjoy water sports for little to no cost. The men climbed into a ventilation shaft, which took them to a fan and grill on the roof of the prison, where they severed the rivets, which held both pieces in place. So when it, the night came for them to escape, it would all be ready for them to basically jump out onto the roof. Mm. Um after all of their hard work, they were finally ready to do what no other person had done before, which was escape from Alcatraz. So it was the 11th of June 1962 and the quartet anxiously awaited lights out. The concrete surrounding the opening uh, of Alan West's ventilation grill had been crumbling away around this time and he had used more concrete in an attempt to fix it. However, when the time of the escape arrived, the concrete had hardened and the hole he had in his cell wall had become considerably smaller. Discussing the problem with the trio of Morris and the Anglins, there was talk of the escape um, being a, quote, all or none deal, um, meaning, you know, we all escape or none of us escape, basically. Mm. Um, however, if West failed to escape, the others would have had to suffer. So eventually, by the time West had made the, uh, the gap big enough to climb through onto the roof, uh, Frank, John and Clarence had already gone. And he returned to his cell at dawn and ultimately told police the entire plan once they discovered that the inmates had escaped early the following morning um, after realising that the prisoners were um, fake. <laughs> With their dummy heads and whatnot. <laughs> so, following the plan to desert West, uh, the trio, having crawled through their ventilation grills, made their journey through the utility corridor and climbing up the ventilation shaft towards the roof. When they broke out of the shaft, prison guards heard the booming sound, um, what they said was a large crash. However, they actually ignored it and didn't investigate it any further. Oh my God. Um, so the three men, on, uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> well, definitely by the next morning, then they would realise their mistake. Um, the three men on the roof uh, slid down a 50 feet kitchen vent pipe and then climbed 12 feet high barbed wire perimeter fences. And can you imagine, you know, how physical that must have been? And I yeah. can't even yeah. begin to imagine how they must have felt, you know, mm. um, you know, the anticipation of the escape and hoping you don't yeah. get caught. It's just it's crazy. Um Having planned in advanced, uh, advanced. Having planned in advance, they fled towards the northeast shoreline, close to a power plant, which actually was a blind spot in Alcatraz Prison's system of searchlights and gun towers. So, 
I don't know if you know they knew this already, if it was just coincidence or if it was just another piece of mm. information Frank Morris had picked up. It was at this location, out of sight of these um, watchers on the gun towers, that they used their makeshift concertina to inflate the raft. Uh, it is believed that on that foggy night, Frank Morris, John Anglin and Clarence Anglin departed from the rock at some time between 10pm and midnight, allegedly heading towards Angel Island, which lies two miles north of Alcatraz. But ultimately, what happened to the men remains a mystery. Over the next 10 days, there was an extensive search of the land, of the air and sea, the operation carried out by law enforcement and the military. They did manage to pick up some evidence. Um, so I have a list here of the things that they did manage to find. Uh, so first of all was a deflated life jacket, which they found 50 yards from Alcatraz. Uh, remains of the raft had washed up on the beach. A single paddle was found floating 200 yards south of Angel Island. Another paddle was found allegedly leaning against a rock, suggesting that they possibly could have made it. However, no bodies were ever found in San Francisco Bay and the FBI concluded that they drowned. Um, in order to come to this conclusion, they considered, first of all, the freezing temperatures, the strong currents of the sea, which, depending on the exact time they entered the water, um, could have either worked in their favour or completely gone against them. And the bay was known to also be a popular hunting ground for sharks, which, of course, is another reason why they, they believe that they could not have escaped. A Norwegian freighter reported a sighting of a male body floating 15 nautical miles from the Golden Gate Bridge. The deceased was said to be wearing clothes similar to that of an Alcatraz inmate. However, the body was never retrieved, so it was never confirmed whether this body was any of the uh, fugitives. That seems really so, odd, though, doesn't it? Like, you see a body in the, in the middle of, you know, the water, and you're like, oh, it's okay, we'll just leave it. Like why didn't yeah. they, why didn't they like take the body on board the ship like yeah that just seems odd for all they know they could have still been alive or yeah exactly been resuscitated so. yeah well yeah they could have potentially been unconscious rather than yeah, yeah. dead so yeah that is really um, weird. So the FBI concluded the investigation in 1979 and stated their belief that the men perished in the waters of the bay. Uh, and as I said earlier, Alan West uh, shared the story um, of their plans on the one condition that he wouldn't be prosecuted. So he said that the men had planned on stealing clothes and a car once they'd reached shore. However, at the time, no vehicles were reported missing. But a later documentary disputed this and claimed that a car was stolen by three men. It was also believed the plan to go to Angel Island was nothing but a misdirection to throw authorities off the scent. There was a small window after midnight where the tide could have actually worked in the trio's favour and although the conditions aren't the same, many swimmers successfully swim the route from Alcatraz to shore every single year. They have uh, an annual event of this. An officer up with the San Francisco police reported witnessing a, quote, pristine white boat uh, on the bay with no lights on and apparently someone on board was shining torchlight onto the water. Police followed up on this sighting, however, efforts to find the owner of the unidentified boat was never found. It is possible that through bribes with Alcatraz guards, messages were passed from the convicts to people on land, which would be how this sort of meeting would have been set up. Yeah. Um, over the years, there have been many stories which suggest that the trio made it to shore and to freedom. A man, allegedly John Anglin himself, called an attorney before the escape had made public news. Clarence Carnes also apparently received a postcard which simply just said gone fishing, which was allegedly a code word from Frank Morris confirming that the escape was a success. Several sightings were reported over the years despite the FBI's conclusion that they had drowned. All three are on the FBI's most wanted list until their 100th birthdays, which are only in a couple of years' time. Relatives of the Anglins have produced evidence that they also may have survived. 
sisters of John and Clarence stated that they received phone calls and Christmas cards. Um, handwriting experts analysed the cards and concluded that they were written by the brothers but were unable to confirm when the cards were delivered due to lack of stamps. Rachel Anglin received a Mother's Day card which just said, love the two. That was it. That was all that was said. And two unidentified people appeared at an Anglin funeral and looked suspiciously like men dressed as women. Um, Police planned to speak with all of the attendees of the funeral service. However, by the time they wished to speak to this rather strangely dressed duo, they had disappeared. A friend said that he met John and Clarence in Brazil in 1975 and actually took a photograph of them, which was released a couple of years ago. Uh, The men had thick facial hair and wore glasses, obscuring their faces, but experts stated that the men pictured on a farm in Rio de Janeiro were, quote, more than likely John and Clarence Anglin. Robert okay. Anglin. Oh, another... sorry, to, sorry to interrupt you, but it's like that's okay. If I, like I've seen the picture myself, and it's like I don't know how they can tell because they're both wearing really heavy glasses and they've got really bushy beards and their hair is all like matted and stuff like that. Like I don't know how they can tell from that because they're just hiding all of their features. Yeah. Yeah. Looking know? at it is really difficult. Um, it is. It's really hard. Um. Robert Anglin, another brother, said that he was in contact with the pair up until 1987, and I believe Robert Anglin died roughly around that time as well. Um, And on the flip side with Frank Morris, an elderly man who who was called Bud Morris claimed in 2011 to be Frank Morris's cousin and said that he had met up with Frank in a park in San Diego and his daughter backed up this story, but it's never been confirmed whether or not this was authentic. The story made headlines again in January of 2018 when the FBI released a letter which was sent to the San Francisco Police Department in 2013. This letter was allegedly from John Anglin, so I've got a little segment of the the note here. My name is John Anglin. I escaped from Alcatraz in June 1962 with my brother Clarence and Frank Morris. I'm 83 years old and in bad shape. Yes, we all made it that night, but barely. The letter went on to say that Anglin was suffering from a terminal illness and said that he would tell the full, true story on the one condition that he would receive medical treatment and a sentence in prison no less than one year. Um, Sorry, no more than one year. Uh, The letter said that Frank Morris passed away in 2008 and buried under a different name and Clarence Anglin passed away in 2011. The letter was tested for DNA, fingerprints and analysis of handwriting. However, all of the results were inconclusive. So questions remain unanswered and the mystery regarding the fate of Frank Morris, Clarence Anglin and John Anglin continues to intrigue and generate interest with many debating on whether the trio survived their daring escape. So I'm going to open it up to everybody. So what do you guys think? Do you think they were drowned oh in the Pacific God. Ocean or they did, did they do the yeah. impossible? I think they survived. I think they survived too. I, yeah. I think, I mean, they were so clever in the lead up to the escape that of course yeah. they planned to make it seem like they drowned or of course they thought about you know how they were the final stages of the escape and how to throw the police off the scent by sending yeah. them to the other island or by telling that i forgot that his name the person who stayed telling him that you know they were going doing had other plans or something like that they of course the best way to make sure that you succeed in your escape is by nobody knowing that you actually you know the mm. the final moment like the final yeah. stages i feel like i, I feel like clever Fra- enough to evade i feel like frank morris would have thought of all of that stuff like all of the yeah. all of the stuff mm. in the aftermath because like obviously police would have been asking questions and the four probably had like a a sort of pact i guess like if one of them failed to escape for whatever reason or if they were captured um to sort of give an account you know, that wasn't exactly what happened, but enough to throw them off the scene, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Do you but guys yeah. think that letter is real, though? Cause why- I think, I th- personally, I think it is, because, like, um, I've read articles well, on it before, and it just, like, 
the FBI seemed very secretive. The fact they didn't even release it to the public until yeah, how many five years? years? Yeah, for yeah. five years. Five that years, just yeah. seems odd in itself. Like I, I think that it's probably authentic. The fact they say it's inconclusive, I think they've just said that to yeah, just to not embarrass themselves. Because like yeah. obviously, if the police were like, oh, you know, um, the letter is from John Anglin. Um, that would have been a whole massive embarrassment for authorities, mm-hmm. knowing that they would they had been fugitives for so long and hadn't been yeah. caught. That, that it just would have been very embarrassing for them, and obviously because I think the FBI were involved as well. So like that would have been really really embarrassing, and mm-hmm. you know police authorities can't afford to be embarrassed in that sort of way, you know, because yeah. then people people lose faith in them. So and yeah. I think they know actually- a lot more than they're letting on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like well, about- it's quite common. Up- a lot of people um in a way sort of root for them like despite the yeah. fact that they're prisoners i think yeah. it's because of how clever the plan was and to be fair yeah. the crimes that they committed weren't violent or they were very like petty that. they were they very were, yeah, petty, petty crimes, crimes. Um, and the fact that the anglins for example used toy guns and only waited until nighttime to rob places hmm. that in itself shows you know a little bit of consideration yeah um, they didn't want anyone yeah. to get hurt like yeah. at the start so I think that's another reason why a lot of people sort of um, support the idea that they made it because in a way they're sort of rooting for them despite the fact that they are criminals. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. Um, but yeah. Like for me personally, I think I think at least the I think at least the Anglins made it. Um, mm. Like mm-hmm. because obviously they were super strong swimmers. Obviously having been used to swimming in really icy cold temperatures yeah. in Lake Michigan in the winter. Oh, yeah. You know, swimming like at midnight in San Francisco Bay. I mean, who knows what the temperatures would have been like, but I mean if they were used to it, that would have worked in their favor. Yeah, Whereas yeah. for example, comparing with Frank Morris, obviously we don't know what his swimming skills were like or, you know, what experience he had in that sort of area. Mm. Um but because he was the mastermind behind the entire plot maybe they sort of all decided to make sure that all of them survived. Like, I think a lot of, some people theorise that, you know, the Anglins would have sort of used Frank and then just sort of discarded him in a way. Um, mm-hmm. But the thing is, so many people in fact- prisons are loyal to each other. Like like you yes. say, like, I think you mentioned earlier about how other prisoners were willing to sort of collect um, all of the resources they needed to escape. Because mm-hmm. it was just yeah, kind of like helped each the other, prison yeah. code, you know, that like, everyone yeah. would help regardless of whether they were going to be the ones who were going to escape or not. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the likes of, for example, Clarence Carnes, who told them about these access tunnels and such, he was helping them out, basically. Mm. I mean, he could have escaped if he wanted to, but, you know, he chose to help help these, these men out. I mean, they were, I think they were all in their sort of, I think Frank was in his mid-30s at the time, so the Anglins were a little bit younger than that, but... Um, I don't know, maybe Clarence thought because he himself um, was imprisoned when he was about 16 and he sort of missed out on the whole, um, you know, living in the real world as a young man. And I don't know, maybe he just felt that because they were only in for petty crimes that they deserved a chance at life. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And yeah, the the postcards and things as well is... um, Another thing that's really interesting, whether or not they were sent at the time that they'd escaped, um, obviously they don't know, but even still, um, I think that, you know, the with the handwriting experts and things saying it's inconclusive, like you say, yeah. is another reason I think that it's possible that they had made it. And then with the sightings as well over the years, like if they hadn't escaped... You would think there would have definitely been evidence of a body. I mean, there was three of them. Yeah. Um, mm. Yeah. Well, you say that, but people go missing all the time. And well, yes. Never yeah, um, but isn't San Francisco be like the the bridge, the Golden Gate Bridge, like a really popular like site? Yes. And also, so many suicides happen. So they search that water mm-hmm. all the time, don't they? Yes. Yeah. No, that is true. Um, but I think the it, it really crucially depends on what time they entered the water at as well um because at the time i think between 10 o'clock and midnight the tide was um pulling everything outwards um so if they had entered the water just before midnight the tide would have been turning and it would have helped them uh, advance towards the shore rather than you know pulling them out into 
um, the Pacific. So. Yeah, it would have been working with them rather than yeah. against them. I um, like to think that they were smart enough to know that the tide would be mm-hmm. doing that after midnight. Mm. Yeah. No, I'd agree with that. And I'd like to think that they set those, you know, the the things that the authorities found afterwards. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like to think that they set that up. Yeah, yeah to make I it agree look with like, that. Yeah. But they planted it. And then what do you guys think of the, the boat in the bay that was allegedly seen on the night that they escaped? That's really interesting because I hadn't actually heard of that theory before. Like, um... Because obviously, like you say, they would have had contacts outside of the prison and obviously plenty of bribery happened in those sorts of places. So, I mean, it's entirely possible that they did manage to, you know, contact someone who could help them escape. Um, Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's very interesting. That one's difficult because there's nothing to point towards the fact that they did in the stab with somebody Mm -hmm. else. And I do like to think that they did it all themselves. But it would make sense if they got someone else Uh, to, like... Yeah, I just don't think it would... can't see how it would be possible if they didn't have any like outside help. I, agree. I just don't yeah. understand how they would have been able to do it. Such a legendary case. It is. Mm. It's one of those cases that's going to frustrate me so much now. <laughs> yeah, because there's just so much, so much sort of on each side that you can't really pick a side. Yeah. You know, there's so much saying that oh no, it's impossible because of the tides and the currents and the sharks, um, and obviously all of the evidence they collected, which said that you know there was definitely a rough time at sea, but. It's just the fact that there were no bodies found. and um, They did actually, I, I don't think I actually said this, but they did find um, a personal packet um, as well in their initial search, which was basically a, a bag full of Anglin photos and contacts. Oh, like, like in um, the Shawshank Redemption, wow. like when yes. um, Andy ties yeah. the packet to his foot. Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, so obviously that would have... Um, he obviously lost, like, one of the Anglins obviously lost that, um, so I don't know if that would swing anybody into thinking that they made it or not. It's just, it, like you say, it's very up in the air when it comes to that sort of thing, because um, maybe they were planning on contacting Anglin relatives when they got to shore, but obviously the personal packet became detached, Um but, yeah, but then maybe just, they did that on purpose too, because then... Yeah, maybe, maybe. I don't know. Because, like, I mean, they were, like, Frank was so intelligent, he definitely yeah. wouldn't have just planned all of the initial escape and then not thought about the consequences and mm. what to do afterwards. Yeah. Um, Frank Morris was a genius, though, at managing yeah. to yeah. execute such a well-thought-out plan, like... Yeah. You know. Uh, like I say, don't condone criminals, but you have to admire the guy. For, yeah, yeah. For, oh, yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. For his planning and everything, yeah. <laughs> Considering his also, he had a really tough upbringing as well. Yeah. Um, you know, his parents didn't really give him a chance. He had to basically turn to crime to live. That was all he knew because his father wasn't there and his mother abandoned him. And mm. yeah, he didn't get the best start in life. Um, so I guess that's maybe like another reason why people like to root for these men as well because mm. they did come from mm. poor backgrounds. Um, so, but yeah, it's 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 been my pet case for a long time, and I just love to um, research it and read about it. I've got like the book Escape from Alcatraz, um, which the which the film was based off as well, and yeah, I think this will always be my favorite case because it's just so, there are so many discussion points. Yeah, um, mm-hmm. well, I'd be really interested to know what our listeners think about this case yes. yeah. do please leave comments uh either on the youtube or send them us on social media i'd be really interested to see what your thoughts and theories are and that concludes the main segments of this episode we'll be right back momentarily for our final case updates segment <laughs> Okay, so as for some case updates uh, in the news recently, um, I came across a case which really was quite intriguing. Basically, the title of this was that a 13-year-old boy managed to solve a missing persons case with his GoPro, right? Oh, I I think I I saw this on 
So, yeah, I heard about this. Yeah. So last, I haven't la- heard about this. Last month on the 24th of August, a 13-year-old Max Varenka, I think that's how you say it, solved a missing persons case with a GoPro. So he decided to go out on a boat on Griffin Lake, which is near to Revelstoke in British Columbia, with some guests who were staying at his parents' lake cabins. And during this particular outing, those on the boat, Max and the guests, uh, spotted what appeared to be a car lying about five metres deep into the lake. And uh, the RCMP, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, also known as Mounties, uh, were alerted of the discovery and looked in the lake, but they couldn't actually locate the car. So at this point, Max jumped into the water with his GoPro and managed to get some video footage of the submerged vehicle. And obviously he gave it to authorities. Um, and they subsequently called in some divers and used a truck to tow out the vehicle. And it was the vehicle was identified as a 1986 Honda Accord vehicle, um, which was pulled out, as I say, by the RCMP. And the vehicle had been lying overturned on the bottom of the lake for quite some time. And upon closer inspection, police actually discovered the remains of a female inside the vehicle. And after a bit of investigating, they discovered that this woman was actually a 70-year-old called Janet Farris, who was from Mill Bay in Vancouver Island. And she was driving to a wedding in Alberta, in the fall of 1992 when she disappeared and she was never heard from again and police believed that Janet had either like lost control of the car or had perhaps like swerved to avoid an animal and this was how she ended up in the lake Um, but that being said there didn't actually appear to be any damage to the front of the car to suggest like any sort of hard impact um obviously it's a very tragic story but at least like her family have closure after like 27 Mm. years of not knowing what happened to her so i think that's quite an incredible story really you know yeah that is the fact that that is incredible the fact that obviously if max didn't have his gopro out there the police might have not actually found the vehicle that they'd seen um but obviously like i say it's it's quite a, a tragic story but at least the family have closure now yeah. yeah you know it makes it makes you think how many cars there could be yeah in these Submerged waters in water. yeah that we just aren't aware of yeah, yeah. that's like what they say if, if you drained all of the lakes and oceans of the world i mean what you would find would be yeah mm, it's incredible me. Okay, so my case is a John John Doe case that was identified this year, John Doe that was identified. Um, So on April 23rd, 1985, in Anne Arundel County in Maryland in the US, construction workers were clearing the site of Marley Station Mall when they came across an old trash can. Um, Inside this trash can, they found human remains um, and the body was badly decomposed and was thought to have been in this trash can for years until it was obviously discovered in 1985. Um, an autopsy revealed that the victim's death was a homicide caused by severe upper body trauma. However, that was pretty much all the information that detectives had at the time. They had no idea who this homicide victim was or who killed him. And for years, this was just a cold case. Um A facial reconstruction image was released of what police believed this victim could have looked like when he was alive. However, this brought forward little information. There was never any really leads in this case. No one had any idea who this person could have been. Um, And then in 2016, this case was reopened um, because detectives hoped that with new, more advanced technology, they might be able to identify this person. And they were finally able to identify him in April of this year, I believe. And he was identified as 19-year-old Roger Hearn Kalso. I think I'm pronouncing his name right. So Roger was one of 10 siblings and he disappeared in the summer of 1962. Family members said that he failed to turn up to a family gathering after Roger told them that he was leaving. Um, He told them that he was going away and that they didn't need to worry about him. I don't believe he ever gave a reason as to why he was leaving. Experts believe Roger was murdered within a year since he was last seen in 1962 and so he had been dead for around 22-23 years before his body was found in 1985. 
his family said that this was a huge relief for them because for years they literally had no idea what happened to Roger. They didn't know if he was out living somewhere or if something more sinister did happen to him, which obviously it did. But mm. now they finally have some answers, even though it's probably not the answers that they were hoping for. Mm. Um, however, police and Roger's family still have no idea who the killer is, who Roger's killer is, and that is still being investigated today. There is currently a $10,000 reward for anyone who may have any information regarding Roger's murder. Um, and I'm sure we can leave some information in the description box if anyone has any um, information regarding this case. It's a long shot, but um, yeah, so that's pretty much that case. He was identified this year, but we still don't know who his killer was. Um, that's the thing, sad. though. It, it is very sad. Um, there are just... It, it's kind of crazy. Like, I don't know... It doesn't happen often in the UK, I don't think. But, like, in the States, it seems, like, so normal for families to completely sort of... sort Not disconnect as such, but sort of lose touch with yeah. other members of their families for, like, 20, 30 years. And they don't think anything of it. Like, for me, like, if I hadn't heard from someone, even in, like, I don't know, less than a year, I'd be like, what's going on there? You yeah. know? Well, I can't, Whereas, yeah. like, I can't they remember, don't think anything of it. Yeah. I can't remember what case it was. Um, I think maybe one of you guys covered it. Um, but it was this this woman who had been in her house for over two years and nobody knew that she was there and when they found her she was just I think sitting on a chair and there was like Christmas presents around her she was like oh rap- she'd been wrapping them up and her TV was on and she'd literally been there for two years oh and nobody God. even realised that yeah no- nobody nobody even one. thought to check on her and I can't remember what case that was but um it yeah. rings a bell um, um and yeah but there's also Different family dynamics, I think. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's just crazy. In this case, I just talked about his family. Literally said that he never gave a reason for leaving. He just left, and so yeah. And they never followed them. Followed them up on it. Yeah. That's well, I guess they had. Uh, they, they, they probably just didn't have any sort of reason to be worried because if he was like, "Oh, I'm going away. You're not going to hear from me for a while. Don't worry about it." Then yeah. they're not. They're not going to think anything of it, are they? They're just going to be like, "Oh, he's." gone somewhere yeah. to start a life somewhere else you know yeah. but then to not hear from him for 22 years yeah i know and i don't know if they ever reported him missing that's something that i couldn't find online oh, right. i don't know if they reported him missing or they just they just didn't hear from him and that was it until his body was found well it reminds me of the the case of um jason callahan i don't know if you've oh, heard of this course, he was yeah. known as grateful grateful yeah. grateful, grateful doe um so basically i think it was in the in the 90s he um he just left home um, and his mother thought that he was just going to watch um, the Grateful Dead on their tours around the world um, or around America, something like that. Um, And then there was this car accident and there were two people they managed to identify one of them, but not, not Jason basically at the time. Um, But the thing is his mother thought like you say, he was just, well, like I say, he was just traveling. They thought that's what he was doing for 20 plus years um because she'd not heard from him she just assumed this and Mm. then they basically i think it was in 2015 he was finally identified and um turned out he had died just i think a couple of days after last seeing his mother um but this whole time she thought that he was alive and just living his own life where he actually died in this car accident um stuff like that is just it's honestly so tragic Yeah. yeah that people go for so many years without knowing what happened to their loved ones and then, you know, to get told that, it just, yeah. like, you can't even imagine how hard that must be. But yeah, like you say, Josh, like, family dynamics has a lot to do with it because if you're yeah. estranged from someone, you don't tend to check up on them, do you? So yeah. just before concluding the podcast, I would just like to announce some breaking news regarding the case of Rini McRae and her three-year-old son, Andrew, who disappeared from Inverness, Scotland, in November of 1976. Now, this case is currently Britain's longest-running missing persons case. The news has confirmed that a 77-year-old man has been charged over the disappearance and murder of the pair. More updates will come as time progresses and we may add some more updates to this in next week's episode. 
And that is everything that we have for you in today's podcast episode. Thank you so much, as always, to everyone for tuning in and listening along. Don't forget that you can subscribe to this podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Please, if you're listening to this podcast on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts, leave a honest review of what you think of the podcast so far. Hint, hint, leave it five stars, please and thank you. <laughs> <laughs> links to uh, all our channels can be found in the episode notes, along with links to the sources used in this episode. And if that's everything that everyone has to say today... Mm-hmm. Yep. We'll see you in the next episode. Yep. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.